Hello, Agora Bible Fellowship. Well, my name is Adrienne Kegel, and I've got a couple announcements for you. I am the Children's and Women's Ministry Director here at ABF. And man, if you are not plugged in on our local community, we would love to serve you. We have so many things going on during the week. We would just love for you to be a part of all the programs, whether you're a child or you're a senior saint, we've got something for you. Well, um, one of the ways that we love to serve you is through our prayer ministry. And throughout the week, anytime, day or night, you are welcome to text us at 97000. And that's just a simple way for you to share your confidential prayer requests with us. And we will be praying for you. So please go ahead and text us at any time. Well, um, Last thing is, as, as all of you know, we are a nonprofit organization, and the way that we are supported is through your generous gifts. And so we would be honored if you would partner with us, if you'd prayerfully consider uh, giving us a financial donation. And it's easy and simple. You can go onto our website and hit the Give tab. It's a, it's a great way, an easy way for you to join us as we minister here in Agora Hills and around the world. So thank you for that. Before we jump into God's word, I would just love to pray for you before we begin. Father God, thank you so much. Thank you for every person as is joining us right now. And Lord, you know all the details going on in their lives. You know their joys and their pains. And so Lord, I pray that you would meet them exactly where they're at. And God, this uh, message would just uh, speak to them directly from you and minister to their hearts. God, we love you and we put the spotlight on you today. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, welcome online church family back to the continuation of our series. Thank you, Adrian, for announcements. Uh, we're picking up in the second half of chapter 12 and getting real close to the end of the book. Just uh, one more uh, message next week as we uh, wrap it up. But this week for our conversation, really, I'm realizing uh, that it's going to be more relevant to one type of person than it is for another type of person. Let me explain uh, what I mean by that, I would kind of throw people into two different camps, and there might be somebody that falls somewhere in the middle, I'm not sure, but the camps that I would place people in is somebody that's either really easily irritated and angry and ready to fight, and the person that avoids conflict at all costs. Well, when I'm talking about the person that's uh, ready to go, that's the person that, man, it doesn't matter, it's the whether it's an online customer service rep, whether it's a stranger that they are interacting with on Facebook, uh, whether it's a friend that's disappointed them, whether it's, uh, it could be a number of things, a family member that's irritated them, a spouse that just isn't living up to expectations, they're ready to go. I was uh, reading of a husband uh, that had gotten a, a get better soon uh, card from his wife, and he was really confused by it and asked, he said, honey, I'm I'm not sick though. And she said, I know. I just want you to get better. And here's the idea here for each one of us is that uh, there's that person we can probably bring to mind. Of course, it's not us. That's always ready for a fight. And then there's the other side of the spectrum. Now, you might be like, I probably fall somewhere in the middle of the spectrum. The other side of the spectrum uh, would be the person that resists conflict at all costs that it doesn't matter. They're, they're going to do anything possible to not have the, uh, a running issue with somebody. They're going to avoid any kind of an awkward conversation. If there's ever uh, some kind of attention, they would rather just brush it under the, the rug. Uh, that's uh, another camp of people. And you might ask why, why that is, why people are wired up differently. And uh, that's, a, that's a great question. That's not what we're going to address today, but really thinking through the person that's really avoiding, avoiding conflict at all costs is who I'd say our message is more related to. And the question is, why is it that that person uh, tries to avoid conflict? And one of the big reasons I would suggest is because they elevate awkwardness over the relationship. They're like, man, I, I really don't want to be made to feel stupid. I don't want to be in this awkward situation. I don't want to have this difficult conversation I would rather just go on with things as they are. It's not worth rescuing the relationship over that difficult conversation. And so Paul is a demonstration for us, really a picture for us of what it looks like to enter in 
to choose to engage, even when you don't feel like it, even when it uh, isn't your preferred uh, mode of operation, well, even when you look silly doing it. And really, I think a lot of lessons for us because probably most of us listening right now can probably think of a conversation that we know we should probably have. If you're going to mend that relationship, if you're going to see it restored, if you're going to see some kind of improvement in that, you know that there's a conversation that probably needs to happen. Well, uh, if you're not wanting to be nudged in that area, then it's probably best that you turn off the video now, joking, of course, but that you actually lean in and listen and see what the Lord has for us. Because man, when I keep going back to scripture, I keep having this theme from Romans 12 that's pointed to, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. So we want to do our part. We want to be able to put our head on the pillow, and that's where Paul is trying to live a conscious, con, uh, according to his conscience, a guilt-free existence. Let me pray towards that end. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this chance to be together and to study your word and how it speaks to everything, even the uncomfortable stuff that we'd much rather avoid in our life. God, we ask that in this text that our eyes would be open to maybe some shortcomings in our own life, some areas where we would rather avoid rather than engage. Uh, God, I just pray that you do a work on us, that we would choose to elevate relationship over uh, maybe even some of our own pride junk. And so God, I just thank you for this chance to be in your word and invite you to move and work in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, well, picking up where we left off last week in chapter 12, verse 11, you get a glimpse of where Paul is coming from. Verse 11, he says, I have been a fool. You forced me to, to it, for I ought to have been commanded, commended by you, for I was not at all inferior to these super apostles, even though I am nothing. All right, that might sound uh, confusing, but the term that you might recognize is a statement that he says, you forced me to do it. Any of us that are parents that are raising kids, we've maybe heard that excuse where you're just like, you made me do it. And you're just like, man, what's happening here? Is Paul really defect, deflecting blame? Well, what, what's happening? Why is he choosing to use that expression? Not at all, really. What he's done is he's been reluctant all along to defend himself. That's why he describes himself as feeling like a fool. He doesn't want to have to defend himself. Instead, what does he say in the text there? He says, you forced me to. He says, I ought to have been commended by you. What does it mean, commended by you? They should have been standing up on his behalf. The majority of his audience had either been led to Christ by Paul or by somebody that Paul had led to Christ. Paul had invested in them. He knew them personally. He had spent time with them. They had seen his ministry. They had seen the consistency of his claims and his lifestyle. And man, they should have been, while he's under attack by these super apostles, is what he calls them again. He did that in the last section. They should have been the one defending him. But instead, they chose to cower in, in silence under the pressure of kind of these uh, loud voices. I was reading uh, MacArthur's commentary and what he says about this. He says, to be silent when aspersions are cast on the lives and ministries of godly men is to share in the guilt of their detractors. Basically, when they chose silence, Paul was forced to defend himself, even though he didn't want to have to do that. Why does he need to defend himself? Because I've mentioned it multiple times. He's wanting to protect his influence in, these, in the lives of these young believers, realizing if he's taken out of the equation, and they're extremely vulnerable. It's like taking a, 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 a baby chick out of the nest, and you're just like, man, you're really leaving them vulnerable when they no longer have that pipeline of God's voice speaking into their life. So Paul is doing this for their best interest. And he didn't want to feel like a fool defending himself, but he said, you know what? I choose to elevate them over how I feel, what my preference would be. It's a great lesson for us. And I think one of the reasons he is able to do that is a clear understanding or a, a clarity about who he was. I think it's interesting because Paul, who we celebrate, who we think is one of the 
strongest believers of all time. What, is, what does he say at the end of that section there? He says, even though I am nothing, even though I am nothing, he had an appropriate view of self and didn't let pride get in the way of an unwanted conversation. Sometimes people will say, well, I don't really feel like having that conversation. I don't feel like it. I, I would feel stupid if I engaged. And he's like, no, I'm, let, I'm putting those things on the side. But even though he highlights his own, uh, his own weakness, he's still making sure to not elevate the others at the same time. He refers to them as super apostles and still being superior to them. It's kind of an interesting one. If you're thinking there's a little bit of sarcasm, uh, it, it's probably there. In the words of David Spade, he's laying it on pretty thick as it relates to this. Continue in verse 12. It says, The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. For in what were you less favored than the rest of the churches? except that I myself did not burden you, forgive me for this wrong. All right, what's he saying there? A little brief detour for a, a moment here just to understand that in the Christendom, there's much debate. You probably realize this. There's not much debate around spiritual gifts and what actually are gifts that were uh, from that time period and what are present day gifts. And some Christians believe that sign gifts were in that time period and carry on present day. And here's the thing. The argument that is made and it can be pointed to here in this section is that the gifts that were attached to them, the miraculous gifts, were attached to apostles specifically. That they were given with a specific purpose to, to validate the authority of the apostles and to demonstrate the the accuracy of the message that they brought. That would be what our church leans to, although we respect other people that land differently on this topic. And you might say, well, what are the sign gifts? Basically, the sign gifts can be summarized by prophecy or basically continued revelation from God, where we have a hard time with that idea when you read the end of the book of Revelation, where he charges us not, not to add, add anything to the word of God. The gift of healing and the ability to speak in tongues or interpret tongues. So those being the primary three sign gifts that are typically talked about, this passage is often used to clarify the temporary nature of the sign gifts that they ceased with the apostles, that they were given to them as a sign, as a demonstration in the early church, but it was there for a purpose, to validate their ministry and to validate the message. So you might say, well, Pastor Scott, are you trying to say that you don't believe that God heals present day? But here's the important thing to understand. There's a big difference between believing that God heals. I absolutely believe that God heals and can point to examples of it in my ministry in life that I've seen it firsthand. But I don't believe that someone has the gift of healing. There's a big difference between the two. If someone has healing at their disposal, I would charge them. Man, let's get you to the Mayo Clinic as quick as possible to rescue as many kids as possible. But here we see that Paul points to the fact that he demonstrated these sign gifts to authenticate his apostleship. And so now he's pointing back to that. There was a use for that. There was a purpose to that. Well, that them in comparison to these claimed apostles, these super apostles, isn't something new all the way from the beginning of the church to present day. There's an argument that, oh, there's still present day uh, apostles or new apostles being added to the list. That's what Paul is shooting down the idea of their claims. Uh, it's an a, it's a ongoing thing. However, the apostles had a one-of-a-kind, non-repeatable and non-transferable role in the history of the church. And Paul spent much of his time both denying their apostleship and authenticating his apostleship. Scripture is real clear on this. You can look it up yourself. Luke 6, 13, it describes who the apostles were. He called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also named as apostles. Doesn't seem very vague there. 1 Corinthians 1, 1, Paul adds himself to that list, called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. These signs and these demonstrations were proof and evidence 
of their apostleship. So he's using that as pointing them back to that as, hey, you've seen this yourself. I find it interesting as it relates to this subject of going into tough conversations. He's obviously in the middle of a tough conversation. He's having to remind them of what they've already known to be true about him. You're like, man, he must be thinking, you've seen this firsthand, you've experienced this, and why do I have to remind you of it? But that didn't keep him from being willing to engage with them. It'd be so easy for someone to write somebody else off and be like, well, they don't even, they don't even appreciate me. They don't even remember all the good that I've done, all the ways that I've been a blessing in their life. But instead, Paul's like, you know what? I care too deeply about these people. That's why I'm gonna continue to engage, and that's exactly what he does here. And he makes some corrections with them in their understanding. For them to explain, he explains to them, as for in what were you less favored than the rest of the churches? The other churches has these same demonstrations of the miraculous, except that I myself did not burden you. Forgive me this wrong. What does he mean, I myself did not burden you? Basically, he's referring to what he's already mentioned, the accusation that they're coming with some kind of an intention of financial gain. He's like, listen, I I didn't burden you. In other words, the only thing you got from me was the lack of a bill. You didn't get a charge. You didn't get an invoice at the end of my ministry. And he, again, using sarcasm, says, forgive me for this wrong. In other words, is it really that wrong that I ministered to you faithfully, that I demonstrated all these signs of an apostle and literally didn't charge you a dime for any of it or, can, or lean into you for support? So if you think about it, he's willing to have these awkward conversations, even when he feels like a fool, even when they forget all that he's done. He continue here in verse 14, even when they don't love in return. Here for the third time, Verse 14, I'm ready to come to you and I will not be a burden for I seek not what is yours, but you. For children are obligated to save up for their parents, are not obligated to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? But granting that I myself did not burden you, I was Crafty, you say, and got the better of you by deceit? Did I take advantage of you, though any of those whom I sent uh, through any of those whom I sent to you? <coughs> Excuse me. I urged Titus to go and sent the brother with him. Did Titus take advantage of you? Did we not act in the same spirit? Did we not take the same steps? All right, we'll pause there. Basically, Paul's planning planning a third visit to go see these knuckleheads. And you can imagine there'd be a real tug of war. At least there would be with me. It's just like, man, I don't know if I want to see these people that are making all of these accusations, that, that are, are, are making these claims about being taken advantage of. You'd be like, man, it'd be so easy to be done with them. But instead, he patiently walks through. He says, I will not be a burden to you. And he explains to them really clearly, I will not be a burden for I seek not what is yours, but you. In other words, I'm not trying to get something from you. I just want to care for you. He's explaining this patiently with them, even when his affection isn't returned. And why is that? Why why is he willing? And he uses a household analogy there. Children aren't expected to pay for their parents' expenses, but vice versa. Parents pay for their kids. I don't know if there's any other parents that feel the weight of that, especially present day with the cost of things where you're just like, yes, I get this analogy. I feel the weight of paying for everything for my kids, especially when a trip to Chipotle is 80 bucks for the family. You're just like, yes, I'm I'm presently feeling that especially so. Paul's explaining, he's coming to them. He's providing for his own needs so that he doesn't have to take something from them, seeing them as his spiritual children, kind of a connection there. And he does it, and he's doing it, as you see here in the text, not begrudgingly. He says, I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. Basically, the idea is he did it gladly. And why is that? I think we get a clue even in that statement, doing it for your what? 
for your souls. In other words, he, he realizes what's at stake here. You're dealing with people, with eternal beings, things that, that literally matter, matter, something that's lasting, something that you're like, hey, if it's a little bit of a sacrifice, if it's a little bit of a uh, difficulty, it, it's worth all of it. I'll do it gladly because I realize what's at stake here. And Paul definitely recognized that. He goes on, I think this is an interesting statement. He says, if I love you more, am I to be loved less? Basically, the relationship was going the wrong direction. The more affection he extended toward them, the less they returned it towards him. Maybe you've had this experience as well, unrequited love, where you're just like, man, I, I care so much about their spiritual health. I, I, I so desperately want to see them come to Jesus, or I so desperately want to see them come back to Jesus, whatever it is, part of the Christian life, what Paul's experiencing is so often a part of our experience as well, but not something that should keep us from continuing to engage, having the conversations. Man, how much have we wanted for somebody to grow in, in Christ, to come to know Christ? And you're just like, man, I, I want that for you, but I, I, can't, I can't make that happen for you. And still Paul saying, I'm gonna lean in even when that love is not, return, is not returned and not reciprocated. He explains, he says, but I granting that I myself did not burden you, I was crafty, you say, and got the better of you by deceit? Get a, a little glimpse of, of just how painful some of these accusations. It's interesting to me how quickly accusations can escalate and how somebody can be vilified. He goes in to make sure he's really clear that in, in some of these accusations that would so distrust and cause people to walk away from uh, his, his leadership and his direction in their life. And he goes through, explains, I haven't taken for anything from you. I haven't been crafty. I haven't done any of these things. Nobody I sent to you took advantage of you. Basically, he's correcting all of the lies. And so that's important for us to understand in some of these conversations that are awkward and you're like, I don't really want to have that. It's okay to be able to stand your ground, to explain something, to actually correct the facts, to say, hey, this actually took place. This didn't take place. I'm willing to uh, acknowledge my error here, but I'm not willing to acknowledge something that I'm, I'm not guilty of there. Paul basically walks through the details to dispel anything that they were suggesting in these accusations. You See that a little bit further in verse 19 says, have you been thinking all along that we have been defending ourselves to you? It is in the sight of God that we have been speaking in Christ and all for your upbuilding, beloved. For I fear that perhaps when I come, I may find you not as I wish and that you may find me not as you wish that perhaps there may be quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. I fear that when I come again, my God may humble me before you. I may have to mourn over many of those who sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity, sexual immorality, and sensuality that they have practiced. Or what is Paul getting at? He's first continuing to defend himself. He's saying, do we have to, he says, have you been thinking all along that we have been defending ourselves to you? In other words, do you think we're just trying to save face? Do you think we're just trying to protect our image because we care so deeply about that? And he's like asking it with a question mark. And then he goes on. It is in the sight of God that we have been speaking in Christ and all, of, and all for your upbuilding, beloved. So in other words, He's saying our words are directed and guided by Christ. Paul's just like, man, I'm not, I'm not speaking in the flesh. I'm not worried about defending my own honor just so I look good, so I can uh, win friends and influence people. You're like, none of that garbage. I do this. I speak led by the Holy Spirit, walking in, in, in line and in check with him. And I do it with your best interest in mind, for all for your upbuilding. It refers to him as, Beloved, I love that you get a little glimpse of his heart for these people. Man, it'd be so easy for him to want to wash his hands of it and be like, man, these guys have wandered away. They're kind of a lost cause. But he's still, as we see here, willing to keep entering in, 
keep engaging, keep pushing because of why? And he loved him. He cared about him. A couple of weeks back, we talked about any motivation other than love is not going to last. And for those of us that are called to ministry, which is every single believer, man, it has to be motivated and compelled by love. I had a cool opportunity this uh, last week. They had a big uh, revival event at a church called Shepherd uh, Church, and it's out uh, in, the, in the valley in, um, what is the name of the town? Porter Ranch is where that's at. And I've gotten to be friends with uh, the lead pastor. His name's Dudley Rutherford over the last year, probably initially from connecting over pickleball. Uh, but it's kind of cool to see firsthand. And he had invited me to kind of start the opening of the evening and to pray over the, the night. And he is very encouraging in that. And standing before, I don't know, three, 4,000 people is so cool just to see a little glimpse of his heart for the people. After the gospel had been clear, clearly shared, I, I loved watching him come up. You could see with, with tears in his eyes, making the plead for them to come to Jesus Christ. And he, he cared deeply about his audience. And I'm just like, man, I, I, I want to keep growing in that arena. I want more tears to be shed over the lost as I was seeing with Dudley, kind of a cool glimpse of his heart. And here we see with Paul's heart similarly. He's like, man, I've done all of these things with your best interest in mind. He says something that might be a little bit confusing. He says, he says uh, for I fear that perhaps when I come, I may find you not as I wish and that you may find me not as you wish. That perhaps there may be quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. What is he saying there? Basically what Paul has is a lot of time that exact same sense that the Holy Spirit gives us, that he's aware that things are a little bit off, recognizing that there's tension in the relationship, that when he shows up, there's gonna be, man, this, is, this, could, this could go really south in this conversation. This could escalate. There could be envy. There could be jealousy. There could be slander. All of these potential things. Basically, the idea you see it on the screen there the idea is I'm willing to go to them even at the potential risk of things blowing up and getting even worse. Maybe someone listening right now is like, man, that describes my holiday season that I'm racing into. I'm gonna be in different interactions and conversations with family members, with uh, relationship friendships that you're just like, man, I just know that if you put the two of us in that room, it could get toxic. But here's the thing. When you choose to elevate the relationship over discomfort, over awkwardness, over pride, when you choose to elevate that, then you choose to show up regardless. He's saying, I'm going to come for this third visit regardless. And here's the other thing that he points to. He's like, I'm also afraid that you're still going to be living in these different areas of sin. <coughs> Some of us are going into relational conflicts where you're just like, man, they haven't repented. They haven't turned from their sin. I'm not going to stand at a distance and wait for them to get everything right and appropriately lined up in their life before I choose to engage. I'm going to enter into the messy. And that's exactly what Paul is willing to do. Elevating relationships over anything related to self. You're just like, man, I don't really want to be in a situation where this blows up He's like, well, I care about them too much. I love them too deeply. And I don't want to go and see all the stuff that they're still entangled in, the sin they're still uh, uh, hooked with. And you're like, well, I'm going to do it because I love them too much. I don't want to look like a fool. Well, I'm going to do it regardless because I care about them too deeply. All of these things, I think, are wonder wonderful lessons for why it's worthy of entering in to have the awkward conversation, to pursue unity, to look for reconciliation. Man, all of that, I would say, has the reward on the other side of it that's worth the effort. And here's a lesson that God's been teaching me in this study this week. Let me pray as we wrap up. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your word and the example demonstrated by some of the people following close after you. Hear the example of Paul. God, we thank you for that example that he is willing to, to, to not just give up and quit on these people once he heard word that they are wandering, once he heard word that they are gossiping about him, 
once he heard word that they were making false accusations, but to choose to enter in, to choose, why? Because he loved them so dearly. I pray the same for us in our relationships, that we would prioritize the relationship over any kind of discomfort, any kind of awkwardness. God, we can't do this on our own. In the same way that Paul claimed that he was doing this, being driven and directed by the Lord, we want that for ourselves. We need you, even with the conversation that's maybe in the back of our mind that we're, we've been avoiding for a long time. God, I pray that even this message, if there's anything that comes from it, that that might be the nudge that's needed to engage again. God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy that we receive, we bask in. May we be extenders of that as well. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.